we believe at Landscape Forums there are many uh, activities that recognize people who are well into their careers, but very few that recognize emerging and young professionals. So this event's special for us. Um, our role is to bring together promising young professionals and students from around the country, connect them in teams uh, made up from people from uh, some of the country's greatest firms, and challenge them to create something that they could give back to the community. And this year's Extreme LA is no exception. Um, it's, it's an extraordinary opportunity. Before we get started, uh, we want to thank a few very important people. Um, so I'm going to roll through the list. Um, our first big thank you goes to Barbara Deutsch, the CEO of the Landscape Architecture Foundation, and our moderators, principals from Lamar Johnson Collaborative, Lance McOlgan and Matt Maranzana, our two team leaders, Chad Brittenall, principal at Smith Group, and Kiate Saraf, senior associate at Michael Van Valkenburgs. Our student uh, participants in the landscape architecture programs at the University of Illinois and Iowa State University. Chad Pirecki, uh, president and founder of Living Lands and Waters. And a special thank you uh, to Dave Heller, CEO of Visit Quad Cities. So with that, I'd like to introduce our co-moderators, uh, Lance and Matt. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Appreciate the intro. Uh, we're going to just use this. This is fine. Thanks. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to use Chad's technique here, but everybody that came today and took their time out of their day to join us for this, uh, clap it out. <laughs> um, my name's Lance McColgan. I'm an architect, and I'm from the Quad Cities originally. Uh, transplanted, ended up down in St. Louis. And just really amazed that uh, we're, we're here today, and all these folks came and really worked hard over this week on this amazing idea, Bison Bridge Concept. So I wanted to thank Chad for uh, you know, introducing us to this idea. And again, allowing us to participate in this amazing opportunity and uh, being, a, being a big part of this. I do want to mention uh, Andrew Dasso is in the audience today as well. Uh, Andrew runs Streamline Architecture here and Artisans here in the Quad Cities and has also been participating in the project as well and want to really appreciate the, the time and effort they put into this so far as well and part of this team. So um, with that, the, the team basically showed up on Tuesday. We were able to do a full tour of the site. We got on the Channel Cat and toured the river and got people a better idea of the bridge, and what was going on there. And then on Wednesday, yesterday, uh, from about 6.30 a.m. until I think probably after midnight, the team really focused did a lot of amazing work and collaborated with each other. And uh, ultimately today, you're gonna see a couple of really cool presentations about what they've done so far. Um, we've asked, generally speaking, in terms of the design work to organize this into four kind of uh, strategies in terms of the design work. Uh, number one, and we really wanna emphasize this is community and the way that this project has an opportunity to connect Illinois, Iowa, people to nature and the river. Um, we have an opportunity to restore native habitat and take a, an existing piece of infrastructure and make it natural again. We have a, a really amazing bridge and a piece of infrastructure that gives us a new opportunity to see the river. So we also wanted to make sure that they thought about how the bridge could, could be part of this overall project. And then finally, kind of the really big idea here is uh, a new national park on the Mississippi River. And we think that, that there's a great opportunity here and we want to further explore the poss possibilities. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, yeah, I wanted to, uh, to also emphasize uh, the amount of work that's gone into this in a fairly short amount of time. I know that uh, we were involved in putting together some initial inventory and analysis, and uh, just the amount of time that that took uh, was, was substantial, right? So thinking about how to resolve the problem and solve the problem, and there's many different layers to it. I think you'll, you'll see some of those unfold here. Uh, it's going to be really exciting. Um, you know, the, the team members that worked on, on resolving this uh, did so in, in a manner that you know, stretched the boundaries of, of what could be. Uh, so a very creative process, uh, very imaginative, and I think a lot of reality-based uh, solutions as well. Uh, but you know, just as a reminder, everyone here uh, is a volunteer um, that you know, have been exploring the potentials and the opportunities of what could be, uh, really helping to uh, 
to set the stage uh, for understanding better the challenges and the opportunities. Um, you know, internally, each team really determined how best to utilize the existing bridge and where the potential new bridge might be. Uh, didn't really take into account exactly where that is because we still really don't know. Um, but it, it does set the stage for a new vision and a new way to think about what Bison Bridge could be. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chad. Chad has a few words for us. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much uh, for coming. And, and most people in this room uh, have either helped the project uh, move forward or, or and hopefully will continue to or, or in whatever reason have a, a, an interest in it. And um, this today has nothing to do with me. This is really cool. And, and Lance had said, um, you know, hey, this is a really big deal, and I just didn't listen. And then I got here and went out to dinner with all these folks. I'm like, whoa, this is a big deal. And then I was on the phone, hey, you got to come to this. It's a big deal. So if I called you late, I'm so sorry. But uh, there, there is a lot of, uh, again, there's a lot of people in the audience that, um, you know, I wanted to see these, these visions. And, and I had a chance to work with the students uh, prior for a one-day thing we did earlier. And just that raw, creative, young talent, uh, you know, and that was the boundary just you know, what do you got? And it was just amazing. They only had 45 minutes to work on it. So uh, with, with what all the hours you guys spent, I'm, I'm so grateful and so uh, anxious to see it. Um, but let me just tell you how this came here. It's kind of a cool story, but my dad was an architectural teacher, drafting teacher um, at United Township and had Lance, which he went to Riverdale and bust in and all that. So um, anyway, so... <clears throat> That's a cool connection there. So grew up in Rapid City. And then uh, my buddy called me up and was like, hey, my brother-in-law wants to talk to you. He works for an architectural firm. I'm like, oh, no, you know, one of those deals, you know? <laughs> and uh, anyway, so, uh, but, you know, I was like, okay. And then I heard it was Lance, and I talked to my dad. He's like, oh, one of the best students I ever had. And, and so I was like, cool. So we met, and then I got the, the scope of his firm, and then he told me about this, but I just didn't get the concept of how important it is and what a cool, unique event, and, and they picked this. So um, I want to thank everybody uh, that, that chose this to, to make it happen. So, and, and if it wasn't for Lance seeking me out and, and, and really driving this home within the company, you know, who knows if we'd be sitting here and who knows what these designs would be um, in front of us. But as a small token of my appreciation, I, I found this in the river and thought of him. So, uh, um, that right there, folks. Here's the reason. Here's the reason. Because uh, it's totally unique, and it's one of a kind. I mean, the other one's out there somewhere, but I don't think I'll ever find it. But um, anyway, I hope this finds is on your desk sometime or on your mantle, one of the two, but uh, yeah, it is unique, like you're home. one of a kind, and you are, you have made this happen, thanks, so yeah, really thanks so much, thanks man. So much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank brother. You. <laughs> thanks, Chad, appreciate that. All right, well, with that, uh, Studio One is gonna go first. All right, well, uh, my name is Chad Britnell, uh, and I just wanted to step in here quickly and, and turn this over to this tremendous team of young professionals and students who've worked so hard. Um, as Matt said, principally all of this work has been conducted in the last 15 hours, right? So I think you'll be pretty impressed uh, through that lens. Um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity, as I know my, I can speak on, for my team, uh, for LAF, Landscape Forums, uh, Lamar Johnson Collaborative, and certainly um, Chad and Kim. Um, this has been truly a fantastic experience, and I'm delighted to kind of step away and let our team kind of go through our project. Give me a sec. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay.
All right, so uh, to start off this process, um, as Lance mentioned, we went on a lovely site tour and a boat tour, and we got to experience the existing site. Um, and then we had to go back to the studio and condense all of that information that we learned. And we did this by each of us picking out three main things. Um, this could have been challenges or strengths that we saw within the site, um, and put them on the site. And <clears throat> with, that, um, with that exercise, we came up with these overarching kind of buckets that you're seeing on the edges. And some of those ideas include access to the site. So how are we gonna get people uh, to all levels, the bridge to the water and also from the surrounding communities? Um, how is it going to be safe for the wildlife and also the people? And also sustainability. Um, how can we make this project work better and function better for the future than it is today? So next, we went on uh, to think about more focused ideas and we thought about the one big thing and we answered the question, the Bison Bridge project will be successful if. And so from this, we all chose this one main thing that we thought would be really important. And as you can see in these bubbles, some of these include enhancing the surrounding community, thinking about the bison and really prioritizing them and the wildlife, and also creating an iconic and memorable experience for the surrounding community and also for others to come in. Um, and so continuing from that in an attempt to, you know, um, lay down a framework or structure all of our individual thoughts, um, we used the, the framework that Lance spoke about a few minutes ago, um, and we used um, those frameworks to ask certain specific questions. Um, the first one was regarding the national park, um, and we asked ourselves how do we embrace and conserve the natural and cultural history, um, make it an inclusive and sustainable place, and what does it really mean to, in our day and age to, to create a national park, and what does that entail? Um, then we spoke about the habitat and how, um, if we were to cut a section of the bridge, then in that transect, how would we serve the habitats that um, live from the bottom of the river to the sky, um, and how the different ecosystems on either side of the bridge would come together. Um, and we are, we're here celebrating a monumental bridge and a river, and it's really important to tell the story of that river. Um, and, and so how can we create a memorable, unforgettable experience um, for the visitors? Um, and how would the community be involved at a local, state, and federal level? And how can we get the community to look at this bridge as more than just a connection um, and as an asset that, and something that they're proud of? So then after coming up with our goals, we looked at some projects that related to what we wanted to do with the site and to get our creative juices flowing and move into design. So we looked at elevated walkways, zoos, national parks, and just other landscape architecture projects that related to what we wanted to do with the site. And one of the things that we thought was really important, as we just discussed, was to have a program of year-round activities so that the site is being used year-round and there's a variety of different activities for different groups of people. And we also wanted to prioritize circulation and habitat for the animals while also including circulation for the people using the site and to provide views of the wildlife that wouldn't impact their quality of life too much. And as you can see, we have a bunch of images here of projects that relate to what we want to do with the site. Um, so our goal is to create a bison bridge. So it's about bison, right? So, um, so the bison should take the priority in here since you know, they're the endangered one. And then we also want to include people, human, in this. So um, we'll make this bridge with multiple purpose, with um, including bison and human. We can coexist, right? And then um, about human, we, um, we are thinking about um, including communities for, um, in both Iowa side and Illinois side. 
And then also we will attract visitors maybe from the whole country. And then at last about the bridge, um, the bridge should be self-sustained. So we think about um, solar panels and, um, and stor storm water management. And also we create this floating, um, floating structures maybe made by um, the trash um, pulled out from the river by um, living lands and waters. So we're taking advantage of that. <laughs> So going off of those, we then, we came together as a group and we started diagramming and creating larger concepts that would later influence um, our overall design. But after we um, got together as a group and started diagramming, we were split into two teams, Team Awesome and Team Fantastic. And going off of those diagrams, Team Awesome really keyed into the idea of bison and humans coexisting and working with the bridge not as a singular layer, but as um, a whole layer, uh, horizontal and vertical. And so some of the programming ideas that we came up for that were kayaking in a boardwalk, potentially on the water level, the land level, the visitor centers open for grazing land for the bison, the bison level, which would be the bridge level, which was also walking and open grazing land, and then the human level, which would be an elevated surface along the bridge for the human and bison interaction. So our idea was just really focusing um, on the bridge as a vertical aspect and not just a horizontal aspect. So then there is Team Fantastic, and we had some similar concerns and questions that we raised, but we had some different outcomes and solutions for those. So with this first image, you can see our main concepts that we focused on. We wanted in the top left, we focused on connectivity of people, but also the bison and how those two connections interact or are separated because we wanted to really prioritize the happiness and health of the bison as well as the wildlife who uh, rely on the Mississippi River for their habitat. So as you can see in the top right of this first image, how that concern plays into our design by elevating the walk for the humans above the bison so that we aren't interfering with their grazing. In the bottom left, you can see the stormwater concerns uh, for improving the water quality of the Mississippi River. And then the bottom right, you can see the important elements that our team focused on. We wanted to create an identity for the bridge, so we thought a good way of doing this would be to create a life-size bison made out of the trash that the living lanes and waters collect from the Mississippi River. This sculpture would be six feet tall and 12 feet long, so it would be a great moment for visitors to take their photo with this. It would be iconic. We also focused on the landscape tr transition from the prairie on the Iowa side to the temperate forest on the Illinois side and how those two ecosystems interact on the bridge. We focused on view sheds that enhance a lasting experience for these visitors. We wanted to create solar energy to be more sustainable. And finally, we wanted multiple different types of educational experiences so that visitors leave this the Bison Bridge with more understanding and knowledge of the environmental systems and the history of the site. And finally, with our last image that is not loading, uh, we were inspired by the path that the uh, bison gr uh, take when they're grazing. It's not a straight path. They kind of meander back and forth. So this, as you will see later, plays a role into our design with the bison and connectivity and the human connectivity. So <laughs> 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 So 
So after the all brainstorming and ana analysis, we created the diagrams that illust illustrate our uh, design approach. The, f um, the first one, uh, we have um, uh, some of the key pro pro programs that we are offering is the wildlife crossing on the bridge and the, um, the human uh, pathway uh, adjacent to the crosswalk. Um, there is a visitor center on the, the both sides of the land. There's an opportunity for kayaking, biking, and hiking. And to enhance the circulation of the site, um, there is the new um, pedestrian walk on the bridge. Yes. <laughs> and there was an existing bike path on the Illinois side, so we are trying to expand that um, uh, over the bridge and then connect to the other side of the, uh, the bridge. Um, and uh, there is opportunity for a future expansion on, um, on the bike pass on the Illinois side um, of the bike pass, and then ultimately creates a 21 mile um, bike loop, bike loop pass. Um, so the, there's, um, the site is home for many um, variety of animals, including um, aquatic lives, um, there's obviously avians. Um, they fly, uh, they migrate over the Mississippi River. They stop at the Eagle Refugee on the Illinois side. Um, there's also important animals, uh, terrestrials, including bisons. Um, there's also a chance for a possible uh, habitat expansion, expansion on north and south, south of the site. Um, the plant habitats are very unique at the site as uh, Iowa side having prairie and then Illinois side having a, a forest type planting. And we are imagining uh, the, the bridge would be like the kind of like a merging point of the two different um, plant habitats. Mm -hmm. Moving on, so lastly, um, we wanted all this development to be um, sustainable. So um, we, were, we had the idea of having barges um, that collects water runoff from the bridge and then infrastructures um, and before returning back to the to the river. Um, there's also an opportunity for a solar panels installations on the bridge and then geothermal the energy to provide sustainable energy for the operation of the bridge. All right, so how this plays out at a master planning scale. Uh, as we heard, uh, our project bridges the Mississippi River, two states, two biomes. Um, and so we thought that having a visitor center on either side of the river, uh, we needed to do that. And uh, we looked at reorganizing the on and off ramps from the interstate. Uh, we do know there is a, a new bridge that's gonna go in and I think our preference would be that that would be on the north side, um, but we wanted our project to kind of stand alone uh, and work with any location for that, that bridge. Um, so on the south end, uh, we basically pull people off I-80, they're going at 80 miles an hour, slow them down, this is a new national park, um, and so each of these visitor centers would be unique to the character of each of those states in those biomes. Um, those visitor centers would have program that would support uh, tourists um, and travelers. So we are thinking that EV charging stations would be located here and take advantage of the solar panels that we have uh, on those bridges. Um, they could also support winter programming for cross-country skiing in the winter as a warming hut, restrooms, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, the other big move that we, we did here is that we put parking below uh, these grazing areas. Uh, so you can see these big green swaths at the end, end of the bridge. So we wanted to locate visitor centers to really prioritize buffalo, uh, to really separate people spaces from those habitat spaces. Um, and then to facilitate, well, one metric that we learned is you need about five acres of grazing area per buffalo. Uh, so for this project to be a success, we really need to link into patch ecology, adjacent open spaces where these buffaloes could, could roam. Um, so you can see that in these big arrows, and we've identified some of those areas. Uh, we're also 
linking together a pedestrian network. So if you stop here, you have multiple places that you can walk, uh, stretch your legs uh, while you're in the car. It's not just the Buffalo Bridge that you walk out and back on. You can drop down, you can experience uh, the river, you can experience, uh, there's this really beautiful wayside that we went up to and, and sweeping views of the Mississippi River. So linking those visitor centers um, up to that wayside. And then we also looked at uh, these enlargement plans on, on either side of the river. So the Illinois side, uh, you can see that below grade parking structure. You come off the interstate, get on that highway and turn right into that below grade uh, parking deck. Uh, you can also see some of those land bridges that would connect the uh, Buffalo Bridge out to these patchwork ecology areas. And then you get a little bit more of a feel where we're keeping pedestrians out on the edge. Uh, and then on the Iowa side, it's a very similar uh, diagram or strategy where we're bringing people off the interstate um, into a parking ramp that's below grade uh, and then having this really nice user experience uh, that connects down to the water. So from there, we really wanted to zoom in on the bridge itself and gain a better understanding of how people, bison, and the wildlife will coexist on the bridge and as they move across the bridge, circulate and experience it. So as Allison mentioned earlier, we really wanted the, the idea of the herd transversing the landscape to, to help divine our circulation and pathways. As you can see on the two plan views on the right side, uh, this also provided and opened up some opportunities to kind of bring the people and the wildlife together, but also separate them apart. Um, another element, we wanted to introduce different levels of experience, so creating a layer idea, layered approach. So you'd have the ground, the low, the ground level experience and transition up to a mid-tier and then an upper tier. We think this provides uh, many powerful moments as you can be on the ground level experiencing the wildlife at eye level, but also transitioning up where they're actually the upper tier creates some few unique opportunities. So you can look down and potentially have wildlife walk beneath your feet as they cross underneath you. It also puts you up into the tree canopy, so you can for watching birds. And being up at this elevation also allows us to swing the elevated boardwalk out over the edge of the bridge and open up views uh, down the Mississippi River. Uh, this image here, this perspective, I think, really helps define and give a better understanding of what this could look like uh, from an upper uh, elevated boardwalk instance. And this section cut down to the bottom right is kind of a long longitudinal cut across the bridge. So kind of transitioning from the lower to the upper and how that all comes together. And you'll notice the eastern temperate forest and prairie grassland at the top kind of bringing those two together and letting them dissolve into one another, creating another fun experience and educational opportunity. Um, we went in to some more detail on some section cuts that I think help better define the space. All right, so here are the section cut of the bridge. So since already a lot of people are mentioning about Mississippi River, it's the habitat for many animals, including birds, people, bison, bats, and fish. So we divide this bridge in elevation to five different layers, and we are also focusing about the sustainability issue by adding solar panel and storm water management um, tool. Um, so then we uh, shift to study about different options that human and bison specifically um, can be interacted um, at the same area. The first one is eye level, which means that bison and human are on the same level, which gave human like 12 feet pass on the side and 53 feet um, for left for all for bison. Uh, you, that kind of, you know, you by adding barrier because of the safety issue, um, you know, human have, can have a close interaction with bison, hopefully can create a memorable experience, and educational signs are added on the barrier 
um, to you know create some educational function to the bridge. Um, then go to the second option we had, which is a mid-level section. Uh, means that humans are five feet above the bison bridge. Um, for bisons, the shade they need shaded, especially in the summer, because the temperature is kind of high. Um, and one concern we had is just the solar uh, soil volume is not enough for the tree canopy. So by adding this elevation, it gives the soil the the space to put the soil in and like plant all those native trees um, to support this natural system. So the third option we had is like um, overhanging one which leave the 65 um, bison bridge completely to bison, uh, you know, adding a human pass on the side, you know, um, not only just gave the capacity to the bison, but also um, creating a view shed for human. They can interact with bison and also look over at the Mississippi River. So, um, we will thank you again for the opportunity, and this is the conclusion of our presentation. Thank you. Nice job, that was terrific, thank you. Another round of applause, great job. We're gonna have, uh, Studio Four is gonna come up here and they're gonna do their presentation next. Uh, yeah, that was amazing. The common comment I heard yesterday was, I've never had to draw a bison before. So um, I think you guys did a great job figuring that out. Um, I'll keep this pretty short. Uh, my name is Kathy. I'm one of the team leaders. Um, this has been, I mean, I echo everything Chad already said. Thank you for, to LAF and Landscape Forms. Um, and thank you to, for bringing us all here. This is like an incredible vision. Uh, Chad and your team, I don't see you now, but incredible vision, incredible to be part of it. I mean, like this is a dream charrette. Thing. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so, um, yeah, I'm going to hand it off to my team. Good morning, everybody. So we first kind of took a look and took a approach of looking at some of the research um, in the Quad Cities. Uh, Visit Quad Cities has really good information about tourism in the area. This is just kind of a, a map that illustrates all the visitors that have come to um, the Quad Cities. Um, some, some information about 93% of the residents believe tourism is good for the Quad Cities, but only 49% believe that it's a destination visitors want to be. Um, something else is, uh, is that 83% of Quad City residents are proud to be a Quad City resident, um, but only less than half brag about being from the Quad Cities. So <laughs> let's give them something to brag about. So one other thing we looked at was just seasonal activities and what can people do when the bison aren't on the bridge and in the different seasons that go on. So we looked at the summer, fall, winter, spring, and then also considering all the water activities. Uh, so first, we uh, study about the bison since the, uh, we are designing the bridge for bison. And uh, uh, we would like to know more about the behavior and the habitat needs of bison. Uh, so uh, first, we know that bison is the migratory animal, but during 19th century, due to the constructions of road and railroads, the number of bison is dramatically uh, decreasing. And talking about the behavior and the habitat needs of bison, we know that uh, bison usually lives in the prairie, the river side, and also the plains. And one to two bison need roughly like five acres. 
and because they live like in prairie, so they eat a wide array of herbaceous grasses and sedges, and of course, they require water every day, and this fact will uh, influence our following design decisions. Okay, so we did some background research on the local ecosystem that makes up the Mississippi River Valley, and these are some of the key habitat types we found that exist in this region, and many of them are quickly depleting, so we hope to incorporate some of these habitats within our design. So another thing we wanted to look at is like the trail systems around the area and how are people using like more uh, transportation to get to different places. So we understood um, like the trails by foot, just different areas within a five mile, 10 mile and 15 mile radius of the bridge, as well as by bike. And most of these are along the river. And then also seeing the water axis of where potential landings for kayaking and canoeing could be. All right, so a couple flooding observations we made just from this map. Obviously, because the Mississippi is so big, it's one massive floodway. So it controls a ton of the water coming in. And there's also a lot of lock and dams also regulating that water level, which is perfect for us because that there's a lot less flooding in our site then for that reason. So um, on the Iowa side, the northern part of the map, there's a little bit of 100-year uh, flooding, or when that occurs, uh, that hits some of the residents. But then coming down to the Illinois side, I, oh, is there a pointer? No, that's just a pointer. <laughs> All right, well, that little, that little orange like blip, uh, that's a 500-year flood, and that hits Illinois. But that's like the only little part that comes into our site, which is great. <laughs> so continuing the conversation about water, uh, there's a lot of interesting activities in the Quad Cities area, like Floatzilla, which is a bunch of kayakers that come around and sit in the water, which sounds like fun. I have to come down for that. As well as uh, Tugfest, which is the only uh, event that can uh, close down the Mississippi River for a day, which is also interesting. It's a tug of war between Port Byron and uh, LeClaire, Iowa. And also in LeClaire, there is a riverboat twilight, a riverboat ferry cruise ship that goes for about one and a half hour excursions, up to two day excursions. Um, but this is all in the proximity of the bridge, which is important to know, and how we can engage with the community more. We looked more into the river activities, the main ones, uh, such as the flotilla, and like uh, how many like uh, uh, estimated like visitors annually. So we have like 1,700 for the flotilla, and it's happening on mainly on August, and we have the boat twilight. Uh, uh, there's like around 65 times per year. And uh, the Tugfest is the largest one, uh, also in August, and around like 35,000 people uh, viewing like this spectacular uh, event across the longest river in the US. And uh, we kind of like, uh, questioning ourselves like what this uh, uh, activities will be like what the turnout will be after uh, our like proposal uh, project and how can we like embrace those and uh, take advantage of uh, all the people that are coming Um, so we were tasked to come up with a variety of development strategies uh, for the site. Um, these strategies, um, there was four key ones um, that we talked about. So we wanted to establish a national park. Um, we wanted some, some nat native habitat. We also wanted a monumental bridge. We also wanted uh, to connect the community and engage with the community. Um, so from there, we... Um, came up with some design iterations, um, talked back and forth. Um, and then uh, we looked at um, the proposed I-80 bridge and we kind of saw some issues with that um, that we, we really thought we needed to address. Um, so 
Um, the, the site doesn't, uh, as we kind of talked about, it doesn't have that big of a flooding issue, but um, we feel like there could be um, some other um, thing to address that a little bit more. Um, there's also not a lot of access to the shore, um, so the shoreline is cut off by, by railroads. Um, there's some private residents um, and some roads as well. Um, we felt like it was uh, a really good idea to engage more with the water. Um, and then also because of the, um, the bridge and the off ramps, um, there was a lot of broken up areas. They weren't very well connected. Um, so we felt like it was important that we needed to connect those areas um, to create a big area for the bison. All right, so again, um, through these development strategy, strategies, um, we hope to establish a national park, expand na native habitat of the region. Uh, we want to cement an icon for the region, uh, give a place that people want to come to um, and look at, and then we also wanted to engage the community um, and connect the community. So yeah, just to reiterate, reiterate a lot of those things, um, <clears throat> some of the issues we saw, we felt it was imperative to just look at the, the future bridge and um, the new proposed bridge that, um, and how it kind of fits into the context. Um, the whole goal here was we're really trying to connect habitat and create large, expansive areas for the bison. Um, so we thought with just this subtle gesture of even just bowing it out a little bit, you're almost creating views so people aren't looking at the bridge or distracted when they're driving, um, but you're also just consolidating those on-ramps. Um, <clears throat> we think a lot of those on-ramps and off-ramps that are currently there are very, um, they take up a lot of space and they kind of segment a lot of space. Um, and then really just that whole green that you're seeing is really this connected system um, for the bison ultimately. And then just adding layers to that, we thought about <clears throat> those four or five different biomes that we talked about, that Gabe talked about earlier, and how we could start to layer and create create these uh, kind of national park components within the, the whole park system um, and create that diversity. So after all of this like research and uh, research analysis and uh, brainstorming we went through, uh, we were thinking about like how can we create an experience for uh, bison and wildlife in general with the people as well and how can we like uh, integrate those together. Uh, we did a, like a quick look into the site and uh, we have like uh, many like habitat zonings we want to connect together and we have the long uh, wildlife corridor as the main element uh, that we care about it, about it. and we don't want any like intersections or like uh, for, from rail, uh, railways and railroads and uh, we do uh, we did like think about where will be like the overlooks the welcoming centers and uh, how can we like uh, create this like uh, uh, comprehensive like experience And so the, the overall um, park master plan that we arrived at, um, it really starts to organize these um, landscapes and habitats uh, on either side of the Bison Bridge um, and also, um, you know, ha having a, a continuation of, of these landscapes and um, grazing areas uh, for the bison and also for um, uh, pedestrians to circulate in um, some iconic uh, areas of the park. Um, and some, some of those features that, um, that we began to organize would be um, the, uh, when, when we started thinking of, of um, some, some moments of, of the overall park experience. Uh, we took into consideration the character of the land on both of the, um, the Illinois state side and the Iowa state side. Um, 
and we thought that there were some amazing uh, opportunities for um, for uh, viewing of these landscapes um, in the Nature Vista overlook. There's some really unique um, elevations and topography on the Illinois state side, whereas the the Iowa state side is um, less. It's less dramatic um, and a little bit more developed. Uh, we thought that <coughs> the the Iowa state side would be um, maybe a great a, a, a great location for a welcome center um, that that you know that you, you would you would start your journey um, there and and that welcome center would have opportunities um, to learn about the ecology and uh, the landscapes that we're restoring on either side of the bison bridge to learn more about um, these uh, special animals and the wildlife and, and the history of, of the site and uh, the native peoples that would have interacted with this wildlife before we were here. Um, and so really it was important for us to um, consider linking all these, uh, all these landscapes and experiences together so that pedestrians um, and, and bison and, and wildlife could interact uh, harmoniously. So just to dive in more to um, how we were organizing some of those elements, uh, this outlines um, some of the uh, pedestrian circulation. Uh, obviously, um, we're, we're wanting pedestrians to be able to circulate on the Bison Bridge itself, um, but there's also great opportunities for hiking and um, you know, have it, having some passive recreation opportunities on uh, the Illinois and Iowa state side. Um, on the Illinois side, uh, as, as mentioned, uh, we had identified an area of the 500 year flood plan um, that actually interacts with the site. Uh, could be an interesting and unique opportunity to to flood some of this site um, intentionally with um, the thought that <clears throat> that park users would be able to interact with that water's edge um, and, and potentially be able to recreate on it um, through small watercraft uh, that could enter into this site um, from the Mississippi. Um, we also were playing with the idea of pushing and pulling that interaction with the water. Um, so to the, to the east of that, um, we're proposing maybe a land bridge over um, 2nd Avenue and the rail uh, that would allow some of the bison to graze and, and be able to interact with the Mississippi River. Um, some of the pedestrian elements um, and opportunities for iconic experiences on, on the Illinois side would be for a, a proposed overlook tower um, on one of the highest points of the site that would, um, that, you know, it, it, it could be a really uh, impactful experience to, to, to see the site. Um, perhaps up in, up in the tree canopy and, and get a sense of really the region and uh, the habitat that, that you're about to go experience. And it serves, a, it could serve as a great destination point for park users um, utilizing the trails. Uh, we've also considered that, um, you know, there, there, there could be an opportunity with the, the realignment of the I-80 uh, interstate um, that, that we could still, that we could still um, utilize some land uh, that, that we have available to 
um, expand upon those, those park experiences and grazing areas. Um, so we've identified uh, a campground where um, park users may be able to have a special opportunity to, uh, um, to lodge on the site uh, where, where some of these, these bison are able to graze. Um, and, and we're going to dive into some more uh, supplemental graphics of, of the bridge itself. But uh, this, this enlargement kind of shows how we're, we're tying together um, areas for, for the, the bison to graze on either side of the bison bridge um, and, and uh, have, have the opportunity to, to cross the bridge as well. The, the Welcome Center um, could have opportunities for special play moments um, in, in the woodland canopy and, uh, and, and could also have uh, maybe, uh, maybe an opportunity for a kayak rental and a, and a boat launch on um, the Iowa State side just north of this area, um, we've identified uh, another opportunity site where we could really maximize the, the grazing of these um, special animals and perhaps have uh, another opportunity for camping and passive recreation on the site. Okay. So we're gonna go through some uh, more supplemental materials. In this next section, we dive into the bridge design. Uh, when we were doing the bridge design, we came together collaboratively and did kind of our own designs for the bridge. And we came up with lots of really, really good ideas. Um, and so instead of narrowing it down just to one design, um, we have three different uh, designs that we are gonna be looking at today. Um, those designs really fit into engaging the community, uh, creating a monument, um, having an icon experience, as well as establishing that native um, ecosystem back into this area. So for concept one, it is the meandering experience. Um, as a river meanders, we were uh, inspired by that in this, um, for this concept. Um, in this concept, there would be push and pull of the path um, within the bison and the wildlife crossing area. This would create little nodes of experience um, and interaction with uh, the wildlife and that area, as well as pushing it out over the river to create better view sheds um, and places to rest. Um, also in these nodes, uh, we talked about how to incorporate play in these areas. So bringing in different types of nature play and to engage um, younger families and kids in the community. Uh, we also talked about in those nodes, um, how can they learn? So is that through material, pavement, signage, um, learning about the history of the Native Americans that were on this site to the present day of this site. Um, another way to activate those nodes that would pull out is to rest, um, creating that spot for viewers who want to bird watch, stay for a while, or even have a quick visit or not as, um, not wanting to do the whole span of the bridge, still being able to experience uh, the water, the bridge, and those views. So a spot to pause and rest. This is a section through that site um, of one of the many nodes that can be um, utilized along this whole uh, bridge. Um, the last slide as well as this are typicals of the whole uh, bridge um, to explore the different relationships. Um, so with this one, it shows that 65 foot span of the bridge with an extension um, over the bridge, um, plus or minus 15 feet to kind of give that undulating, meandering experience. Um, throughout the bridge, we do keep it pretty human level um, to really give that human and wildlife crossing um, interaction um, and really get to be able to see the size and um, interact with the wildlife. Um, throughout there, there would be straight structures in different areas to pause, as well as different areas to play, um, as shown in this section. Um, 
Something else we talked through is seasonality. So winters get really cold here in Iowa. Um, really cold, lots of fun. Um, <laughs> and so we noticed that uh, the Quad Cities areas, um, cross country skiing, snowshoeing, um, was an interest to them. So in this Buffalo area, if they are not crossing and there's not wildlife, maybe we can put a course in or flood it for ice skating to really activate the space in all seasons. Uh, so these are just looking at some of the precedent images of playing with seeding, topo of the area, um, bringing in that nature play, providing a native uh, planting experience on top of this bridge, as well as providing adequate area for um, the buffalo. So this image talks more to um, that monument of the bridge, creating that icon for the community as well as to set it apart. Um, so going back to that meandering um, gesture that was talked about in the previous slide, that also could be um, a fence, a screen wall along the side. Um, it could be an art piece, but also it would be on the north side to distract from viewers and cars um, to provide less opportunity for crashes and provide a safer experience, but creating something cool to look at. Um, within this fence and structure, we talked about different ideas of what could be implemented in it. So is that bird nesting? Are there areas for birds to come, create habitat, pause as their migration? Um, are we allowing vines to grow on it, create this um, living wall um, through plants? Or are we um, adding wind terms that turbines into it to create um, zero uh, emissions on this site and be able to be self-sustaining? Uh, or is it a combination of all three? Um, so this is overall just activating the space for all ages and abilities as well as uh, focusing on the community and the ecological aspects. Okay, so this conceptual design seeks to emphasize the monumental aspect of the bridge, the Bison Bridge, by having these weaving pathways go around and above the bridge. Uh, it creates immersive viewing angles below and above to see the bison and the river, and then also connect both the habitats within the project and park and the community. Uh, the red bike path is, or the red path is a bike path that connects a long stretch of trail, bike trail on the Iowa and Illinois side. So it would link a circle throughout the Quad Cities. And the orange path is for walking. And then this section kind of shows the different elevations or heights that would, you would be able to see the bison from above or walking below, then you'd be able to get better views of maybe the, the wildlife, the migratory birds that are using the water and also the river itself. And these are some of the presidents uh, that, that inspired this that we could look at. And uh, those are not buffalo wings, those are actual buffaloes. So <laughs> just wanted to clarify. Um, concept three, which I think is aptly named uh, Jurassic World, is just that. Um, it's really about creating a huge destination iconic structure that can kind of encapsulate the bridge, the national park, something that people really get excited about and want to visit. So this axon, I think does a really good job of just kind of explaining some of the elements and organization for this concept. Uh, so we're proposing essentially a, a raised cantilever um, track that could host you know, a series of visitors that would pay for the experience. Um, and the idea is essentially to remove structure and space and to provide the crossing to, uh, specifically for the bison to maximize their habitat and to really start to create some of these interesting landforms and to give it some more interest as you progress along. And there's part of the, the concept also revolves around addressing the existing as well as proposed infrastructure. We really wanted to strike 
a clean balance between you know some of these hardscape materials but then also softening it with you know different items like you see in this axon um, for instance the angled lines that you see could potentially be native vine species that would act as potential habitat and feeding for native migratory bird species um, in a later graphic you'll see we're proposing actual um, bird and bat habitats on the those blue structure beams that you see um, what else? Um, also, the potential to have solar panels um, built in and incorporated into the design of the structure. So this section kind of shows um, spacing-wise what the relationship would be, and I think it really serves as just a solid observation deck and an experience for the visitors, something that people can really get excited about as they kind of hover over bird's eye view and kind of spectate um, the buffalo as they cross. And on the section, you can also see down the right side um, little carve out areas for habitat. Um, and I would say addressing that side of the bridge was important to us. We looked at ways of how this really um, stark hardscape straight line through a river could maybe soften and mesh and merge a little bit better with existing ecologies in the surrounding landscape and better serve everyone in the process. Here's some precedent imagery. So as I mentioned, solar panels on the articulated um, beam, um, space for bird habitat, native vine species, passive viewing of the buffalo, and then really, again, providing the full width to get kind of a robust native grassland planting and prairie for the buffalo. That concludes our presentation. Um, I think we have one more slide maybe, yes. Just to reiterate um, kind of our four guiding principles, um, establishing national park, uh, creating an iconic monumental bridge, expanding native habitat, and engaging connected community. So thank you, appreciate it. One more. All right, that was amazing. I'm gonna put my boot right there. Thanks, Chad. Uh, let's give another round of applause. It's a lot of, a lot of great work, amazing job. Um, we're going to do a quick q and I just wanted to remind everybody, this was all done really in the course of yesterday, like one day. Uh, I think that's really amazing, the, the amount of effort that was put into this. I want to commend the team leaders for their passion and their, uh, their energy yesterday. Um, you know, there's, these are teams of 12 people that, that have to be organized, and, and these presentations have to be developed. So let's give a round of applause for the team leaders. Um, and I think the last thing before we start the Q&A um, is just, a, I think, a quick understanding of kind of where we are, you know. This is unsolicited design work. These are volunteers that took time out of their, their busy days, whether it be their work life or school, to come here and uh, participate in this. I think that says a lot about the idea that's, that's in front of us here and that people from all over the country are willing to come here and spend this time and really are passionate and interested in participating and, being, and, and seeing this thing really become a reality. So um, really exciting. And then I think in terms of the design work, just to keep in mind before we start the Q&A, this is um, very, the very beginnings of design thinking. So the project doesn't have a program. We don't have a master plan. We don't have concepts. Uh, nobody is being paid to work on this. This is really the very beginnings and part of the process that we're, we're involved in is that it's, it's inclusive. And we're involving people from all different walks of life, uh, different disciplines, and uh, really trying to get informed and better understand what's in front of us, opportunities and constraints. We don't know where the bridge is going to go. Um, that's a process that's outside of this. So um, the idea here is this is inspiration for future design work that will happen at some point, hopefully in the near future. 
Uh, but that's really the context of, of what this is all about. And what's next, we're not, we're not exactly sure yet, but something soon and we'll be announcing that. But we anticipate to keep the, keep the ball rolling on this and keep this moving. Okay. And I, I just want to mention for those of you who didn't know what landscape architecture was before you came today, uh, hopefully this paints a, a clearer picture of, of the, uh, the way that landscape architects think, uh, as you mentioned, collaborate. You know, none of these people had worked with each other uh, previously. Some of the students may be in class together, but uh, again, that goes a long way to really uh, pull a lot of this together, what we're looking at today with, with a group of folks that you've never really worked with. It'd be hard enough for us to do it with folks who work with every day, um, not to mention that, you know, they pulled it off within uh, 24 hours. So um, with that, I think we'll open it to questions. I think we're gonna turn the lights up here and. Um, not use the screen. And then Kurt, I don't know if you had any, you can close this out after Q&A. Okay, great, thank you. Um, all right, I'm gonna turn the lights up so we can see hands. And hopefully I hit the right buttons. Um, but Matt, why don't you help me out and let's just go ahead and open it up. We need a microphone. Uh, I think what we'll do is go ahead and ask your question and then we'll restate it. We can restate it in the microphone. Okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, this is good, this is good, yeah, thank you. Will this presentation be uh, uh, shared with the DOT so they understand what your concept and what you're trying to do? So the question was regarding whether or not the presentations would be shared with the uh, IDOT, Illinois Department of Transportation, Public Knowledge. I, Kurt, maybe uh, this, is, this is Landscape Forms Forum. You know, they really put this on and uh, we're participants, so yeah. So yeah, we'll, everything will be available that you saw today. Um, ultimately, there'll be a white paper that comes out at Landscape Forms website. Um, but yes, information will be available. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not a bison expert. You know, Chad has really been in depth in all this stuff, and we've had conversations and discussions about that. You know, that's a, a big future master planning and conceptual thing that has to get figured out. Um, the, you know, Chad's the best to talk about. I'd probably answer this question, so I'm going to do my best. But, you know, the, the big idea really is about that the, the bison are, are endangered. There's a lot of effort being put in, and there's, ex, there's herds being established in Iowa and other parts of the country. And we want to connect to those systems. We want to connect to those people and learn about what, what, how that's done and how it's done right. So there's still a big process to really get in the weeds on how that works. And we realize, you know, there's, these drawings are showing things that are beyond, you know, the, the private or the public property. And we, we're very sensitive to that. We understand that the drawings can sometimes be a little disruptive to especially the folks that own or, or know people that own that property. We, we aren't making any assumptions about, about those kinds of things right now. It's literally just a design process to really understand, you know, what's possible and what, what are the opportunities here. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. Are there any estimates on the annual number of visitors? <sighs> wow, that's a great question, yeah. No, I, uh, sorry, I'm going to restate it. So. Uh, Estimated, anticipated number of visitors that could be coming here. I think the, the, the number that I recall, and this is not from a visitor standpoint, just the amount of people that are crossing the bridge today is around 42,000 people a day. Uh, and that number is only expected to go up, obviously. So I think there's a pretty big capture area. Um, obviously, you're going to have a lot of folks who live here that, you know, that's not going to be part of their daily uh, routine. Um, but I think, uh, you know, there'll be a decent percentage that, especially, you know, if, if things evolve the way some of the thinking was brought about today, uh, there's great opportunity. Yeah, I think I saw a stat today that, I, you know, I'm from Rapid City, Port Byron area. Uh, I saw a really great stat today on one of the slides that was put together about uh, Tugfest, you know, and that 35,000 people are participating in that between the two sides of the river. So I would expect we're going to blow that away. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. This reminds me of the master plan that was commissioned for Los Angeles County in 1925 from Bartholomew and Olmsted. And as an example, B 
the idea of the Los Angeles River being a possible flood zone drew them to suggest that there needed to be quarter of a mile wide greenways all the way down to San Pedro. By 1940, it was paved. Utopian visions like this are great in the safety of lecture halls and computer screens, but when you've got mature towns, residential networks, and two major industrial corridors, one for wheel transit, the other for watercraft, I don't see how this thing can possibly be a benefit when the collision of people and animals is so often destructive. We've got three ideas here. We've got a national park, a zoo, and mature towns. Pick one. This is cool. It reminds me of being at Scott the Sire. But I don't see how this can go anywhere. Okay. I don't. Does there give a specific question you'd like to ask? No, there okay. isn't. Okay. But you know what? I don't know what to ask you guys. Okay. This is just a fantasy. This is a real bridge. We live in a place that will be declared eminent domain mm -hmm. to reroute that, that freeway. And so do I. So, one of the, one no, of the things no, right through our you've land. got this fantasy that you've nursed for 20 years. You I don't waste my time with fantasy, and I'm not that. here to argue with you. I, I sympathize with you, and I talked to you 20 minutes before. Yes, so and we didn't want to hear this. I have to come over to your house and answer any questions. Bottom line is we have nothing to do with where the new bridge is, period. This, you can guess, some of it is fantasy, but we want to see all ideas, sir. You know? I mean, no. I'm sorry that they're going to take your house. Us too, on certain ones, we have nothing to do with where the new bridge is. If, if there's an opportunity to keep the bridge and do something iconic and one of a kind that adds to the focus of the Mississippi River and wildlife, why not? What about the Sir, what's your question, please? Thank you. Well, both comment. I, I thought the, uh, I don't know what you call it, the cable car or whatever was in the last presentation was yeah. quite interesting, actually. My comment a little bit is that I know locally there's always been a lot of interest in making sure of having either a hike and bike component to the Bison Bridge, or maybe that could even be part of the new replacement bridge like was done on I-74. I just want to put that out there, that that's really a very high priority also, I think, as, as part of this bigger vision. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think just maybe rephrase a uh, question about the opportunities between what's for the animal, what's for the bison, or what's for people. I think, you know, that's something that we actually discussed internally quite a bit. And I just want to a reminder again, this is a one day effort, you know, from folks that actually aren't, most of them aren't from here. So we're getting outside ideas, and again, we're conceptualizing about what the opportunities are. And I think this is one of the, probably one of the biggest, you know, things to debate, concept, and discuss, and it should be given quite a bit of time to review and get all the information together. Because obviously, depending on which way you go and who you give priority, there's, there's big influences and in, in changes in how the design will ultimately end up. And I believe that as this progresses, there'll be a significant amount of study and illustration around, you know, which way to go. Sorry about the audio. I'm not sure where that's coming from. No, and just... I got one. Yeah, come on. One just, just to address the folks, like my parents live there, Jaden and Janice live there, Tony lives there, wherever he is, and there's probably other people out there. It was the first thing I said on the tour was, these folks, we don't want to impact their life. If we do...
if you could use a mic so they hear on the stream. But what I'm saying is, and I apologize, uh, just there is a great opportunity here. And to tell you the truth, I believe the Quad City deserves it and needs it. I really do. I, I want to be, I want this to be as open and transparent as it has been and continues to be. And Kevin on our team, which was in charge of uh, Illinois, I, Illinois Department of Transportation and this bridge in particular, has been working on our team. He's been saying that the entire time and uh, we will continue to do everything we can. But this is such a great thing that you guys have done here and these students. And, um, and I hope that you will, all of you, if you've got an idea, don't think it's too crazy, throw it at us. Because I'll tell you what, it'll be evaluated, and when we go into a much bigger, hopefully, public forum, we will take all of these ideas together and put them together in big groups of people and come out with something really kick-ass. So that's all, I just wanna say that. Yeah, Chip, thanks. You know, I also think that uh, the Quad Cities has an amazing opportunity. I mean, this isn't the only aging infrastructure in the United States that's going to be dealt with like this. If you guys could be on the... Thank you very much, everyone. Can I get Gate uh, and uh, Chad down here and Matt and uh, Lance, uh, please stick around. Um, so on behalf of the landscape... Here you are. Um, I think it's amazing the work that was done today uh, by the students. Um, uh, sorry. Oh, I got <laughs> you said... <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Thanks for coming. Thank you.